Good morning and welcome to worship here in Mount Calvary AME Church, Townsend, Maryland. My name is Reverend Angie Crawford Cox and I serve as the First Lady for this congregation. Here 
Here at Mount Calvary, the entire month of May is dedicated to women. And how ironic it is, today is Mother's Day. We celebrate mothers all over the world. We are glad that you're here to worship with us today. We want you to be blessed. We want you to share this word, and we want you to respond by faith to the preach word. Let's go to worship. Morning, Mount Calvary and friends. I hope everybody's doing great this Sunday morning. I, I know we're doing church a bit differently still, but it's a blessing to be able to gather with you all here as a community of believers. It's May, and everybody here knows that this is when we celebrate women at Mount Calvary. And although we aren't in the sanctuary together, we still celebrate the beauty and the gift of womanhood. And so for today and the rest of this month, we're going to be sharing a few words of encouragement for the women who are worshiping with Mount Calvary on Sunday mornings. Our women's theme this year is Same God, New Life, New Perspective, Ever-Changing Me. How powerful and how relevant is this theme that was set some time ago before our lives became what they are today? And all week long, I've been thinking about how much our lives have changed over the past eight weeks. Many of us are now working from home or not working at all. Or some of us who casually went to work before now find ourselves going into places that have become high-risk work environments. On this Mother's Day, many of us have experienced a shift in what it means to mother. And some of us find ourselves having to pray to God daily, asking, for patience, patience to face challenges of motherhood that we never expected to face, being homeschool teachers and babysitters and employees all at the same time. It, it, it's been a challenging moment in history, but God is with us today. And the God who is with us today, when our lives are shaken at our very cores, is the same God who was with us eight weeks ago, the same God who was with us eight months ago, the same God who was with us eight years ago, the God who is with us today is the same God who was with our mothers, our grandmothers, and our great-grandmothers, the God who was with our aunties and our cousins and our sisters as they were going through, they're going through. God is the same. The Bible says, I, I am God. I'm the Lord God. I change not. Our circumstances change, but God doesn't change. And I'd like to suggest to you today that a change in our circumstances is a good thing. I believe that it gives us new perspective and it changes who we are. It prepares us for the new life God has in store for us. I wonder how many times we found ourselves in a challenging circumstance and our commitment to resisting an internal change prevented us from seeing the life God was preparing for us. I, I ask you that again. How many times did God put us in a season of preparation for what God was about to do in our lives, but we were so resistant that we missed out on what God was preparing us for. T today, I want to challenge each of us to pause, to sit back, to be still with God. I, I want to encourage us to not be so quick to want to get out of sheltering in place. I, I want to encourage us to Avoid resisting the idea of having to shelter in place. Don't, don't be like my cousins who are here, there, and everywhere. I, I know this is hard. I know it's difficult. But maybe in this moment of our history, God, who has not changed, is trying to do a new thing in our lives. And, and maybe we need to slow down and to cut out some unnecessary things, some unnecessary people, and some unnecessary conversations. So God can get us to where it is God wants us to be. But maybe it's time for us to take a moment to do a self-assessment. Look at what our lives look like now. 
Look at the lives of our families, our church, and our community. Not because God is trying to break us or penalize us, but simply because God is trying to offer us some new perspective and give us some new insight on that new thing God is doing in our lives. Because whether we believe it or not, whether we embrace it or not, after this, our lives will never be the same again. Our lives will never be the same again. And that excites me because it means that in this season, in this moment, God has done something to shift me and shake me and move me to my next. Let me assure you of this, because it may feel a little uneasy to know that life will never be the same again. Let me assure you of this. The Lord will still be our shepherd. We aren't going to want. We will lie down in green pastures and we will walk beside still waters. Our souls will be restored and we will be led in the paths of righteousness. And even though we will walk through some difficult times after this, the Lord will comfort us and prepare tables before us in front of the people who have doubted us and talked about us and discouraged us and challenged us. Yeah, after this, we will have new anointing and goodness and mercy. They'll hang out with us. And we will walk with God forever and ever. I, I believe that for you today. Just remember that we still serve the same God. And God is giving us new perspective. He's giving us new life. And he's changing us into who it is he's called us to be. I pray that you have an awesome and amazing Sunday. I pray that God will bless you greatly and that heaven would smile down upon you. God bless you. Have a great day. And we say thank you to Reverend Don for those empowering words for Women's Month. Now let us get ready to hear a word from God this Mother's Day from our very own Reverend Bobby B. Cox Jr. Hear ye the preacher. God, our Father, we come to you, your throne once again, with bow our heads and our hearts. How grateful we are to you, O God, that you have allowed us to assemble ourselves together once again. God, we pray now that you will be in our midst. We pray, God, that you will manifest yourself in a mighty way. We pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you will touch hearts, that you will touch minds. We we pray, O oh God, that as your word goes forth on this day, God, somebody will hear and upon hearing, they will believe you. Upon believing, of oh God, they will confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God, we ask now that you be with us in this preaching moment. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to call your attention to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Uh, the New King James Version has these words recorded as the text for today. In the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Uh, listen for the word of the Lord. On the third day there was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and a mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. For a few minutes this morning, I simply want to tag this test for preaching. Mother knows best. Mother knows best. My brothers and my sisters, my sisters and my brothers, today is Mother's Day. A day in which we remember, recognize, and give reverence to our mothers as gifts from God. Mothers are wonderful. No doubt they have the hardest job in the world. So we praise God for all of our mothers today. We
We thank God for godly mothers, mothers who know their, that their role is to know their child's calling, mentor their child in godly ways, uh, facilitate their child's call, and to let go of their child when the time comes. We praise God for godly mothers. On a personal note, I believe I would be a much better person than I am today if I had listened and abided by all the godly wisdom and advice I received from my mother. Mm -hmm. I recall on many occasions after receiving her advice, she would say, I've been where you're trying to go. Mm -hmm. But I thought to myself, she doesn't know what she's talking about. But later on, after I had rejected her advice and followed my own mind, and it turned out just the way that she had said, I found out for myself that mother knows best. Right. Today's text is found in the Gospel of John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. In today's therapy, we have what John labels as the first sign of Jesus' earthly ministry. In his gospel, John highlights seven of these signs in order to fulfill his purpose and to engage his readers to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, believe, by believing on Jesus, one is granted eternal life. Pregnant within the womb of each of these signs, as John calls them, or miracles as the other gospel writers call them, is a message about Jesus. And each of these signs is a portrait of the personhood of Jesus and a sneak preview of Jesus' divinity. Moreover, these signs not only reveal that Jesus is God incarnated, uh, but they also demonstrate Jesus' willingness to meet the needs of our ever-changing lives. It is evident that John has a keen sense of the progressive movement of Jesus. And John uh, chronicles and catalogs this progressive movement for our understanding and for our insight. In addition, John's writing is full of symbolism and allegory. For when John says in verse 1, on the third day, John may very well have been alluding to Jesus' resurrection after three days, in which Jesus would then make preparation for the great wedding feast of the Lamb of God and gather all who would be guests into the kingdom of God. Uh, thereby making Jesus' first sign of Jesus' first miracle a means of pointing to Jesus' final sign to reveal his glory. The text says there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Among those on the guest list are Mary, the mother of Jesus, Jesus and his disciples, along with family and friends. The text, the text says, when the wine runs out, the mother of Jesus says to him, uh, they have no more wine. Uh, let me hang out there for a minute. On the third day, after Jesus had called his first disciples and began his public ministry, uh, he, his disciples, his mother, his family, and friends are all invited to a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Weddings are and have always been considered uh, major events. Human history, human history began with the marriage of Adam and Eve, and human history will end with the marriage between the bride, which is the church, and the groom, which is Jesus Christ. In a very real sense, Jesus endorses marriage when uh, he accepts the wedding invitation in Canaan, and his presence uh, implies that he agrees with marriage. In fact, Jesus ties every knot and signs every license. He believes that marriage is honorable. Well, here they are at a wedding in Canaan of Galilee. A wedding is a big deal. 
deal in the Jewish culture because uh, there is a certain protocol that is to be followed. And unlike our wedding, the Jewish wedding lasts more than a day. It's a week-long celebration. And, 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 and this particular wedding in Cana of Galilee, we, we know very little about it. Uh, we don't know the bride's name nor the groom's name. We, uh, we don't know if they were high school sweethearts or whether it was love at first sight. We, we don't know how long they dated or where he popped the question. Uh, we don't know their ages, their economic status, their birth place, nor anything about their lives after the wedding. Uh, we don't know if their union produced any children or if their union lasted till death parted them. But we do know that it was and still is the world's most famous wedding. Even to this day, it has never been surpassed. Royal weddings are impressive, but they are not like this simple wedding that took place in, in, in the Galilean village. The weddings of actors and actresses have star power, but this one has divine power. Uh, however, something happens at this famous wedding in the midst of a wedding celebration. The Bible says the wine runs out. And, and, and when the wine runs out, it's a major crisis because in first century, running out of wine at a wedding was a social disgrace and the host could be sued for a breach of hospitality to his guests. Yeah. But how could the wine run out? How, how, how could the wine run out? I, I, I ask myself the same question. So being a spiritual snoop, looking for a spiritual scoop. I, I discovered something. I discovered something. Uh, the other day, as I was reading and doing my exegetical work for this somatic presentation, I discovered the fact of sociology and geography, geography uh, that gave me some insight that added to my theology. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it said, it said, Galilee, Galilee was essentially divided in two parts. And, and these two parts represented two different social economic pictures. Uh, one side of the, of the town was down by the Sea of Galilee, and, and those who lived down by the Sea of Galilee were said to be people of little or meager means. Uh, yeah. they, they were said to be poor folk. Uh, uh, and they were seen as the folk who did not have much. They, uh, they were the folk who had to hustle just to make a living. They, uh, they were the folk who couldn't make ends meet without a struggle. Uh, and they were always in need. They were always dependent. They were, they were hopelessly handcuffed by helplessness and handouts. Uh, but then there was another area of Galilee called Canaan. Uh, Canaan was known as the well-to-do section of Galilee. If you lived in Canaan, then you were thought to be well off. If you lived in Canaan, you were thought to be a big baller and a shot caller. If you lived in Canaan, you were thought to have had everything that it would take to do whatever you wanted to do and to be whatever you wanted to be. If you lived in Canaan, then you had your life together. Uh, you didn't need to, uh, to have a Concerned about the cares of the world, uh, you didn't have to be dependent upon nobody because you had everything that you needed. You had it in your pocket or you had it in your bank account. Uh, and yet the Bible declares uh, that it was in Canaan where the wine runs out. Uh, oh, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Y'all y'all missed it. I did all that work. Y'all missed that. If the wedding happened down on the other side of the track, uh, then you wouldn't be surprised that the wine ran out uh, because maybe they had not bought an, enough wine uh, because they did not have enough money. So you would expect this kind of crisis on the other side of Galilee, but you would expect it to happen in Canada where you got more than enough. Uh, no, you would expect wine to run out in Canada, but the Bible says the wine ran out. Yeah, the wine ran out. The, the wine, the wine ran out. Yeah, if the wine ran out in Canada, then to show even in the best of situations, uh, stuff runs out. Uh, emptiness occurs. The, the unexpected happens. The wine runs out. Uh, well, well, when the wine runs out, the hostess stood there 
uh, the host discovers uh, that uh, they have no more wine. And, 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 and because they didn't have any more wine, you understand, they could not just uh, go down to the neighborhood package store and get a few more bottles of wine. The wine ran out. But mother knows best. When Mary learns that the wine has run out, she approaches Jesus and says to him, they have no more wine. Mary understands the urgency of the moment. And, and, and John's narrative seems to suggest that Mary knows of Jesus' power and identity. Mary believes that Jesus can fix the problem of the wine crisis, even though there is no indication that Jesus had uh, had, had performed in his sign or in a miracle prior to this event, but for whatever reason, Jesus' mother believed that he could solve the wine crisis. So she goes to her son and, 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 and she says to him, uh, and this is Bobby's translation, she said to him, baby, you need to fix this situation. And she gives him one of those mother talks. She says, baby, before you were born, your daddy sent an angel to talk to me. And he told me how special you would be. Now, now I'm, not, I, I'm telling you, you got to do something that nobody else in this room can do. Uh, because you have something that, that nobody else has. You have divine power. So, so, so you need to fix this situation. But Jesus, but Jesus, but Jesus doesn't seem to respond in a positive manner to his mother's implicit request because uh, he says to his mother, woman, uh, uh, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus' response may appear to be a bit harsh because uh, he refers to his mother as woman. Uh, uh, but so, and, and because he first refers to his mother as woman, uh, uh, let me place this disclaimer out there. I, I, I do not suggest that any of our young folk use uh, this response at home with your mother. If she says, take out the trash, uh, don't you say, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not come. And she says, make up your bed, clean up your room. Uh, don't you say, woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not come. Uh, if you say it, you, you, you just might discover that it has everything to do with you and, and that your hour has come sooner than you anticipated. Uh, so what Jesus is saying is, uh, is he setting a bad example? What is Jesus saying? Is he setting a bad example? What is Jesus saying? Is he setting a bad example? No, 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 and no. Uh, here it is. Jesus' response is uh, not as unkind as it appears to be in our English translations. Uh, his reference to his mother as woman was a common term in the first century, and it doesn't reflect disrespect, but neither is it a term of endearment. But rather, it appears that Jesus' abrupt response seems to be setting the parameters for his relationship with his mother. Uh, uh, for many years, Mary had, had raised Jesus as her son, but, but now Jesus is redefining their relationship. Uh, he's establishing distance between them. Uh, why is this, you ask? Uh, because no longer will family relationships uh, be the determining factor in Jesus' life. Uh, he's beginning his public ministry. He's starting a journey that will end on Calvary's cross. Uh, and just as every other human being, Mary can't get saved and get to heaven all the hook up. Uh, but she must respond to Jesus by having a saving faith. Uh, she must embrace him as her personal Savior and Lord. Moreover, Jesus seems to be reminding Mary that uh, he is controlled by obedience to the Father and not by human relationship. Uh, his hour is coming, but it is an hour that, that will only be determined by his Father and not by his Mama. His, his, his destiny is not controlled by human relationships, but it's controlled by divine appointments. Well, the text says in verse 5, after Jesus uh, uh, responds to his mother, uh, and his mother says to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. 
Ah, mother knows best. Mother, mothers and God have a unique relationship. They, they have a unique understanding. But do you not realize that Mary just preached a one-line servant? Uh, whatever he says, do, do it. Just, just do it. Uh, John 2 and 5 is the last words of Mary recorded in the Gospels. Uh, John 2 and 5 is the only commandment given by Mary in the entire Bible. Mary says to the servants, uh, whatever he says, I, I, I don't know what he's going to say. I, I don't know uh, 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 what he's going to tell you. I, I don't know how it's going to work out. I, I, I just need for you to do uh, whatever he tells you to do. Uh, then look at the text uh, that Jesus is about to do something. Yeah, yeah, we see the text that Jesus is about to do something. After his mama told the servants to do whatever he tells you to do, Jesus now is about to do something. Jesus looks and he sees six full of pots. Uh, the pots are mostly empty because uh, each guest has been given water to wash their feet in their hand as they arrived. Uh, in John's uh, in, in John's well of mixing events with metaphor, uh, the stone pots represent the Old Testament law and its inability to make a person truly clean. The water pots held about 30 gallons of each and Jesus tells the servants to fill the pots to the brim. Yeah, he, he tells them to take them, he tells them to take some of it to the steward. And, and well, by the time the water gets to the steward, uh, to the, it has turned, it has transformed from water into wine. And when the steward tastes the wine, he is shocked because he has never had wine taste so good. Jesus, Jesus just doesn't make some ordinary wine, but it's better than that which uh, they had at the beginning of the celebration. And the steward accuses the, the bridegroom uh, of breaking a first century custom of saving the best wine for last. In, 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 in verse 11, John states that, 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 that this was the beginning of the signs and the miracles in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And as a result of this sign, this miracle, Jesus' glory was revealed and his disciples believed him. But it all came about because mother knows best. Yet Jesus uses the occasion of the wine shortage to reveal God's plan of salvation and redemption to the world. Jesus takes that an embarrassing situation, a situation of need and want, a bloom and despair, and redeems the situation. I mean, in, in this time of the coronavirus, uh, some are saying, and, and, and listen to 45, uh, others are saying, listen to the governor, others are saying, listen to the mayor, others are saying, listen to the medical experts. But, but like Mary, when we have a problem, when, when we have a crisis, we should consult a specialist. Uh, when we are empty, when, we, when all of Stuff is gone. When, when we are facing a crisis of, of pandemic proportions, uh, we need someone who specializes in making ways out of no ways. Yeah. When we find ourselves beaten and battered, we need a specialist. Uh, when we find ourselves dealing with a uh, failing and faulty finances, uh, bankrupt relationships, broken homes, uh, reservoirs of lost dreams, uh, helpless, vanishing hope, we need to consult specialist when more than light plague our lives uh, prohibits our pursuits uh, and leave us stranded on an island of suffering and sorrow we need to consult a specialist and mama told me uh, the specialist that we need to consult is Jesus uh, and mama knows best uh, yes when you talk with Jesus you will understand that he'll walk with you that he'll talk with you that he'll show Yeah, yeah, yeah. She knew who to consult. 
fault and she knew who could turn it around. Uh, the text lets us know in verses 5 to 10 that that, 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 that Jesus turned the situation, that, that Jesus turned the crisis around. Uh, he used six water pots that uh, he asked to be filled to the brim to turn it around. Uh, 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 this is how I know that he turned it around. Uh, 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 John used signs. Uh, a sign points to something. Uh, a sign conveys truth that otherwise would not be known. Uh, uh, to manifest something significant that might otherwise be hidden. A sign is the outcome of a combination of human and divine activity. Uh, yeah, yeah, here it is. Uh, a sign points to something. Uh, a sign points to something. Uh, a sign points to something. There were six water pots. Uh, they held 30 gallons. Uh, now, if I can multiply right, uh, six is 180 gallons. Uh, uh, 360 is a complete circle. 180 is half. Uh, Jesus can turn it around. Uh, if he, if he, uh, he can turn it around. Uh, he can turn it around. He, he would turn it 180 degrees. Uh, he's not going to turn it 360 because you'll be back in the same place, but he's going to turn it 180 degrees. Uh, I mean, somebody ought to be shouting right now for 180 degrees because you know it's only a matter of time before Jesus uh, turns your situation around. Yeah, it's only a matter of time before Jesus do a 180 on, for your, on your situation. Yes, it's only a matter of time before Jesus turns it around. Uh, so you don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. You don't have to panic. You don't have to be uneasy. All you got to do is just believe that Jesus is going to turn it around. Amen. Yeah. The third and final thing is uh, she knew who to, uh, not only who to consult, she not only knew who could turn it around, but she knew who could transform the situation, who could transform the crisis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, something happened to the water between verses 8 and 9. In verse 7, Jesus told them to fill the water pots to the brim, and they did. In verse 8, Jesus told them to draw some water out and take it to the chief steward, and they did. In verse 9, it says, when the chief steward had tasted the wine that was water, stop. Between verses 8 and 9, a transformation occurred. That which was water in verse 8 became wine in verse 9. And it wasn't bad wine, but it was the best wine. Uh, I tell you today, the Lord is still in the transformation business. Jesus just didn't come to give us information, but he came to give us transformation. He just didn't come to bring us new ideas, but he came to make us new people. The world wants us to get a new hand or, or a new wardrobe. Society wants us to get a better job or learn a new skill. Folk want to lose weight uh, and gain weight, get a face lift or uh, a tummy tuck. Uh, but Jesus doesn't want to change your looks. Uh, he wants to change your heart. Uh, he doesn't want to give you a new suit. He, he wants to make you a new person. He doesn't want to rearrange you. He wants to transform you. Uh, you want to look better on the outside, but he wants to make you look better on the inside. And when that transformation takes place on the inside, I declare it will show up on the outside. Yes, yeah, somebody, 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 somebody is in Canaan of Galilee, a place that represents abundance, a, a place that represents wealth, a, a place that represents more than enough, a, but you are still in a crisis. Uh, let me roll down your street uh, and get in your heart, mind, and soul. Uh, you find yourself in a place you said you would never go. Uh, you find yourself in a position uh, that you thought you would never find yourself in. Uh, you discover yourself doing some stuff.
yourself uh, that you thought was beyond you. Uh, some, something has gone wrong in a place uh, where you thought you would never have to go. Uh, yes, something has gone wrong in a place uh, where you thought that it would never go wrong in. Uh, you didn't get married to catch hell. Uh, you didn't get a job and a raise to be broke. Uh, you go from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you got a job but you stay broke. Uh, you write checks over them and pray and then deposit bring the check to the bank. Uh, ah, but you are absent. You are in Canada. I mean, you dress like you, you live in Canada. You got no cologne and perfume like you live in Canada. You drive a car like you live in Canada. But if we were to go to your house, uh, you would you would have to admit uh, that you are struggling in Canada. But let me tell you today that uh, the Lord woke me up this morning uh, just to tell you uh, that Jesus uh, can transform your crisis. Uh, that Jesus can transform your situation. Uh, he can transform uh, the ordinary elements of your life. Uh, to extraordinary vessels uh, to demonstrate his power uh, and his love uh, to an ever dying world. Uh, he can transform your situation. Uh, yes, uh, he can not only turn water into wine, uh, but he can turn a sin into a saint. Uh, he can turn fear into courage, uh, joy into sorrow, uh, defeat into victory, uh, despair into hope, uh, death into life. Uh, the peace. He can turn frowns into smiles, deserts into gardens, rips into warriors. He can transform your situation. He can transform your life. Is there anybody here who knows that the Lord can transform your life? Yes. He can transform your life. Mother knows best. Jesus performed his first miracle at Cana of Galilee because his mother urged, his mother pushed, his mother declared it to be so. Amen. And because of that, he performed his first miracle. Mother knows that Jesus' first miracle was brought about because of his mother. And my brothers and sisters, I want to let you know today that the Lord is still working miracles in our lives. Yeah, that was the first one that he did while he was on the earth. But ever since that day, Jesus has been working miracles in folk life. And he's able to work a miracle in your life today, in the midst of, of, of a pandemic called coronavirus, I, he can still work a miracle in your life today. It, it doesn't matter if you isolate, quarantine, shut in. He has a way of walking through doors. He has a way of coming through windows. He has a way of working things out for your good. But you got to have a relationship with him. That's right. You got to have a relationship with him. And so today, we want you to get connected up with him. Mm. If you are not a born again, regenerated, saved child of God, today is a good day to get saved. On Mother's Day, it's a good day to get saved. It's a good day to become a part of God's family. All you have to do is just admit that you're a sinner and, and repent of your sins. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died for your sins on Calvary, got up on the third day morning, confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you're a part of the family. You're in God's family. And after you get in God's family, then you got to get connected up with a church family. Where you can grow and become all that God has created and designed you to be. So this morning, if, 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 if you have heard the word and the word of God has pricked your heart and, 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 and you want to be saved, you can be saved just where you are today. 
Wherever you are today, you can be saved and watch God work a miracle in your life. If you're here today, if you if you if you are here today, if you are here today, if you are here today and, 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 and need salvation, don't put off the day for tomorrow. For tomorrow is not promised. God our Father, we thank you so much for your word going forward today. We thank you, God, for those who have had ears to hear, eyes to see. We thank you, God, for those who have confessed you as their Lord and as their Savior. We thank you, God, for Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, for his life, for his ministry, for his death, for his resurrection. We thank you, God, that even now that he's sitting in heaven and sitting at your right hand and he's making intercession for us. So God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for being an awesome God, a mighty God, a good God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your healing power, for your delivering power. Thank you, God, that you're going to make ways out of no ways. Thank you, God, that you're going to give financial breakthroughs. Thank you, God, that you're going to heal bodies. Thank you, God. We praise you. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Thank you for watching today and sharing with us in the worship experience here at Mount Calvary. We do not take for granted. We do not take for granted your presence via social media. We know, understand that you could watch any ministry, but you have watched us today. And we pray that you'll be blessed by what you have heard. Mount Calvary Church family, thank you so much for all that you have done to make ministry live. In the midst of a pandemic, you have made ministry live through your ministry of giving at Mount Calvary. The mission, the ministry, the message is still going forward. And we still need for you to engage in the ministry of giving. Gay, engage in the ministry of giving. Give. Ah, please give. My mom carried church family. Mail the gifts. Go online. Use your electronic devices. Cash out. Give a buy. Call in. Ask for Sister Ursula. Those are four ways that you can give to the ministry, the mission, and the message of Mount Calvary. And we want you to know that you will be blessed by your giving. You will be blessed by your giving. Thank you for joining us today. Again, it's been a good day. It's been an awesome day. It's been a mighty, mighty good day. And we praise God for it. Thank you and God bless you. Wasn't that a good word? Mother knows best. We thank God. A good God sent a good word preached by a good man. Y'all keep your pastor in prayer. Mount Calvary, we want you to be aware of our announcements for this week. Our 6 a.m. prayer will go on from Monday through Friday, so please call in. And then on, on Wednesdays, we have um, Wednesday Bible study. Pastor Bob's preaching on the Beatitudes. And our harvest meal is up and running. Although we're not serving at our facility, we are taking our meals to the public. So the harvest meal is up and running. And then Thursday, we've started something new, Zooming in God's Word. We had over 20 participants um, last Thursday where we were preaching or teaching on uh, faith under fire, and it was a wonderful exchange. This Thursday, we will have our guest facilitator, Wendy Peters from Mobile, Alabama, uh, for, um, teaching on uh, the black sheep, 
God favors the black sheep. So tune in. Those, those um, the zooming email um, information will be sent out by the office. So tune in and um, and just um, come in fellowship and dialogue with us on Thursday. And then on Sunday we'll be right back here with our church school. Church school begins at 9 a.m. And our youth are also Zooming and having church school at 1 p.m. on Sundays. We are a busy church. And then at 11 a.m., right back here, Sunday worship, we are declaring that God is good. Will you rejoice with me today? that God has favored this church and this ministry, and we thank God for what you are doing to make ministry come alive at this place that we call Calvary. You know it all happened at Calvary. God bless you until the next Lord's Day.